Before we begin, I would also like to add a trigger warning for anyone who is sensitive to certain topics. Please take care when you're watching this video. Pause it, take a breath if you need to, or we will add timestamps so that you can skip around and skip over the parts that you may not be comfortable hearing or watching. That man that was talking to you, you know, he said the word S-E-X. What does that mean? And I mean, mom and dad ripped me away from the table and spanked me to let me know that you will get disciplined if you ever say the S-E-X word ever again. That is a bad word and that English person used it and you should have never heard that. I figured out where a baby comes from on my own when I was 16 years old. Oh my gosh. I think it's very dangerous not to have sex education. There's young men that are 13, 14, 15 years old that are their hormones are, are, are raging through them. They don't know how to act and they'll respond in a way where all at once they get addicted to it and they just take it out on their sister. And so you have some of those happening around Amish communities. Yeah, that is absolutely terrifying. That is terrifying. Hey, my name is Shalise Ansola, and this is Cults to Consciousness, where we discuss leaving high-demand religions or organizations and finding healing and independence through awareness and true individual sovereignty. If you're only listening, head on over to my YouTube channel so you can see our faces at Cults to Consciousness. You can join in on the conversation and leave some words of encouragement for our guests who are bravely coming on and sharing their story. Subscribe, hit the bell so you don't miss any episodes, and we're trying to go live more too, so that will also notify you when we go live. Today's guest Guest. We've had him on once. We're bringing him back because there's still so much to cover. We are discussing the Amish lifestyle, specifically the one that he was raised in, the Old Order Amish. And in the previous episode, you can go back and watch it, or you can just watch this one first. Really doesn't matter how you do it, which order. But in the first episode, we talk a lot about who the Amish are, their roots, where they came from. We talked about a variety of different rules, shunning. Uh, we talked about awareness. And in this episode, we are going to dive into what their education is like and how that relates to sex education, how that relates to dating and marriage and the different things that come with that. So thanks so much for coming back, Eli Yoder. Well, thank you very much for having me back on. Absolutely. And for those who didn't see the previous episode, Eli has his own YouTube channel and he talks about all of the ins and outs of being a former Amish and answers all of your questions. And he also does the same on TikTok. We're definitely going to put all of his links in the description so that you can go find him and support his content as well. So Eli, where do we even start with this? I guess we could start with a comment. This is one of our commenter questions. I put up a poll and asked people Hey, I'm talking to Eli. Do you have any questions? They had a lot of questions for you. <laughs> <laughs> Here is one of them from Kelly Pat 125. Curious if he or others ever desire more education than what was provided and how that was handled. So I guess first to answer this, we have to know the extent and the level of education that's provided to begin with. So take it away, Eli. Yeah, well, the Amish are known to just go to eighth grade. I mean, our old order community, the way our lifestyle was, we did not need more than that. So we went from first through eighth grade. And after leaving the Amish, I can verify with you seeing my son's homework that our eighth grade was around second and third grade for oh. out here. So we had like basic add, subtract, multiply, divide, you know, just basic math. We didn't have no algebra, none of those kind of things because it wasn't needed because of our lifestyle. But after leaving the Amish, I uh, furthered that. Uh, about 10 years after I left, I ended up going to school, got my GED and then my CDL to drive semi truck right after that. And that's what I do now. But in, in the Amish, it really wasn't needed because they don't go to college to, to live the Amish lifestyle, which is construction and farming. You really don't need to have any higher education or go to college for anything else because they don't, we didn't, we wasn't even allowed to become doctors or police officers or firefighters or truck drivers. So all of those things didn't matter, but just because of the lifestyle itself, we, we didn't need any higher education. And even in, in the early 1950s in Pennsylvania, it went to, to the Supreme Court where the Amish landed themselves in the Supreme Court and they voted to give the Amish their rights for freedom of religion. They have many exemptions mm. for many things in their life that they can practice is how they wish under those exemptions they are allowed through the supreme court and it's never been overturned it's been the same since 1951 and that since then we have all this this includes even the new order amish old order new order schwarzenegger amish they all just go to eighth grade that's it but this is all within your own schools right this isn't public school out in the the secular world 
That is correct. When we started our community, my grandpa was the first bishop. So they had a meeting, obviously, with the local uh, uh, government leaders, you know, the local county. And, and they uh, had a meeting and said, hey, you know, we, we want you guys to come to our public schools, you know, having Amish for the first time in the area. We want you guys to come to our public schools and all of that, because by law, you have to go to school. Mm -hmm. Well, they went to court. It, it didn't go further than just the local courts, but they said, hey, look, we as Amish people, we always have our own private Amish schools. We don't believe in allowing our kids that are opening or opening our kids to those kind of exposures of the world, you know, how they dress and, and all of the things that the kids uh, talk about. We don't want our kids to be exposed to all those. And they went back and forth a little bit. It got a little bit heated, according to my grandfather, but they ended up telling them, hey, we're willing to pay school tax if you allow us to have our own private Amish school. And still to this day, that is the only tax that my community pays because they want their own private school. Wait, that's the only tax they pay in general? Yes, because we were old order. We were actually tax exempt under a four digit code for our freedom of religion rights. There's no federal, there's no state tax, there's no sales tax. If my Amish community, the members walk into a store to buy something and they show this religious exemption, they don't even have to pay sale tax. What? I've never heard of that before. Yes. Yeah. There, this is actually very common for the old order. There's also a lot of newer order now that have social security numbers like Holmes County, Ohio and Northern Indiana. There's a lot of new order Amish that have social security numbers and they, they voluntarily pay taxes. They're part of that system. They have no problem, but my group, they do not, they don't even allow social security numbers. And that's why I had to apply for one when I left the Amish. So oh. since we had no government ties whatsoever, we were tax exempt for religious freedom. Oh my gosh, how interesting. So I'd like to know what school actually looked like. Like, do you have any stories that you could share about what was going on in school? Was it more focused on God and then a little bit on, like you said, the math and arithmetic type of things? I just kind of want to get a full picture of what school looked like for you. Well, it was a one room schoolhouse and the first row was first grade. The second row was second grade. And if it was only four kids and there was only four seats, if there was seven, then there was only seven seats for that row. So there was eight rows from one wall to the other. It went from first through eighth grade, but it's all in one room. Mm. And every single morning we would sing in German, a German song that we also used on Sunday morning at church. And we memorized this song by heart. We could literally sing this song without opening the book. But if you didn't know it, you would open the book to give you one just in case. But we always opened every school morning, every kid in school would sing that song in German. And then we start into uh, reading, writing. Okay. You had by second grade, we had to speak English to the teacher, no matter if we couldn't, we had to at least try because that is, that was mandatory. We had to speak the language so that we can learn it. By the time you get out of eighth grade, you have to be able to communicate with outside English people and speak English. So the normal uh, math was in there until Friday. Friday was only German day. We had to read and write in German, the biblical German that we had through the Martin Luther 1522 version of the Bible. We had to write that and read it. Oh my goodness. I forgot to ask us in the last episode, but it's more relevant now. The language that you spoke to each other just out and about, was that always German? That is called Pennsylvania Dutch. Okay. So they come over from Switzerland when they were the Anabaptists and the Amish inherited this, uh, like a Dutch German language and mostly German. It had a heavy German influence. So now all once they come to America, they're learning English. So now they're learning English along with their language, which is German. Now they kind of mix together. The Pennsylvania Dutch is named after the state of Pennsylvania because that was the earliest settlement, the first Amish that became Amish through Jacob Amon coming over from Switzerland. Mm -hmm. They migrated over to Pennsylvania. So now once you have German and, and English mixing together and the words started changing, I always call it either low German because it's like a, it's a Dutch language that has a English and German influence. So, but it, it's a heavy German dialect, but people from Germany, they always laugh. I've done TikTok videos about this and they said, hey, it sounds so different, but guess what? I can literally understand you and figure out what you're saying. <laughs> How interesting. So when you go and visit your mom, do you speak to her in that language or in English? For the longest time when I put my Amish clothes on to go visit her, she demanded that I speak that, but I let her know 
I've been out now 25 years this year and I struggle with it. If you don't use mm -hmm. it, you kind of lose it, you know? Right. And she was kind of sad, you know, that I would say that. And she, I, I think she felt like I was just kind of making it up, but she'd rather have me speak the Pennsylvania Dutch language. So I can understand it better than I can speak it today. So here's what we do. I always say, mom, go out, just have at it. Speak the Pennsylvania Dutch language. I'm fine with it. I can understand you, but I'm going to reply back in English. And that's what we do. She speaks the Pennsylvania Dutch when I'm visiting and I speak the English. Okay. Wow. Would you be willing to share one or two sentences in the language so we can get an idea what it sounds like? So usually when I walk in, uh, I always greet her with, how are you doing? Which is, wie bist du and du? And she'll say, ich bin gut, which means I am good. <laughs> oh, wow. That's cool. Yeah. So it, it, lots of times when people ask me, uh, if I can speak the Pennsylvania Dutch, I always reply with "Kan du dad Schwetzer and "Kan du me verstehe," which means "Can you speak Dutch and can you understand me?" <laughs> nice, that's pretty cool. So, as far as school goes, is there anything else that you want to share as far as how it may be different, how focused on the scriptures school was, or if it was? strictly secular teachings. The only scripture that was taught was when you had to write it, because if you get selected by lot as an adult married man, you can be selected to be a preacher. So they, at a young age, you have to write it and understand the context and how it's worded. But as far as teaching and understanding what the Bible means, absolutely not in my group. I know there's some Amish in, in America that do, that are more open to that, but my group, group was very much minded this way. You don't question or read into it too much, or you can be deceived. You must follow the elders. Let the elders, if you have a question, go to your mom or your dad, and they will bring it before the church. The elders of the church are supposed to help you interpret that. And many a times you'll hear, well, we've always done it this way. Don't read too much into it. Just drop it. Just let it go. So you couldn't really have too much questions when it comes to the biblical text. You know, hey, what about this? Why, does, why, why do we do this and, and ask in the Bible? Where does it say it in the Bible? Most often when they can't explain it away, they'll just say, hey, we've always done it that way. So we didn't have a deep understanding or teaching in our schools. We just had to understand what was there according to our traditions. You know, doctrines and commandments of men is what I call it because they use certain scripture for that to, to back that up. But you couldn't go deeper than that. If you, Let's say salvation. Even if I asked in school, like, hey, that word salvation in our German Bible, what does that mean? They always said, oh, no, no, that's you can't read too much into that because you'll be, be deceived by the by the devil. So I always just dropped it. OK, it's almost like another form of information control, because if you're not even allowed to search, ponder and pray within your own scripture, you're never going to come across something that's contradictory. You're just supposed to obey at all costs. Right. Yes, exactly. They really protected their traditional way of life. They did not want you to read too much into it and have any questions according to the Bible, depending on what it was. Maybe they ex tried to explain it, you know, to you. It just depends on what you ask. But it, every time it came to salvation, you know, hey, how about we put our faith in Christ for salvation rather than doctrines of men, commandments of men? Oh, that was a very sore one because they we were very heavily taught that you have to just always do as you're told. We've always done it this way. Okay. So then we didn't really get into this in the last episode either. When it comes to going to church, what are you actually learning? I know some people wanted to know, what do the Amish believe when it comes to theological perspectives? Well, I can speak for my particular group, which is very old order. They call it original. And you are very works-based. Rules, works, you, you're a good person and you help all of your Amish neighbors out and you keep the Amish rules in the ordinance. The ordinance is kind of what I now call the replacement of Christ for salvation, for eternal life in heaven. <laughs> they kind of replace that with an ordinance because the ordinance you have to be aligned with and always keep it the best way you can. And if you don't keep the ordinance, the ordinance then they punish you, obviously. Mm -hmm. So we were the uh, Amish. When you hear him stand up and preach on a Sunday in my Amish church, you will never, ever see a Bible open. They What they read during the week they memorize, and if you can't memorize it, then you can't preach. But oh. you have to memorize what German passage you're reading, and they stand up there and they speak from what they memorize. They don't need, there's never an open Bible. And then you hear a lot of fear. I, I really kind of disturbs me looking back now. We always heard a lot of fear of how the worldly people go to hell, the ones that leave our church to go to hell. And that's a really little Amish boy sitting there on Sunday hearing this. I was terrified. I was right. living in fear. Like, 
wow, I feel so bad when, when those leave, when I heard a story of somebody leaving, mm -hmm. I was crying. I, I felt bad for them. Like, I really believe now they're going to hell. And by the way, that's why I also felt like I was going to hell when I left, but I did it anyway, because I wanted to be free. But that's what we heard on Sunday. That's what they taught. It was a lot of what I now call uh, pride. You know, they had a lot of pride in their, their way of life. And they taught that that's the only way. I mean, if you don't stick with this and how, what, what our forefathers have handed down to us, then you can't please God. So that's usually what we heard a lot on Sundays when they preached. Okay. So when it comes to old order versus new order, someone had a question about how did you view the other Amish who weren't necessarily following all the rules that you were following? We questioned a lot as a teenager before I started uh, doing the classes for baptism, which I ended up not following through with because I rode a bicycle and broke some rules. But during that time... I had questions. Hey, all of the New Order Amish that are not far from us, 20 minutes from our community was a uh, New Order Amish. And I said, hey, you know, they got bicycles there. And you guys told me I can't get baptized because I rode a bicycle. And they're like, well, they're modernized. We don't fellowship with them. They, they became too, too uh, modern and they're of the world. And, and so you didn't want to question them too much of why the New Order do what they do. So one time I actually asked mom, I knew dad didn't care, but I asked mom, I said, Hey, you know, I, I saw a girl that I'm in, interested in, in the new order Amish. And she immediately cut me off. She says, if you date a girl in that Amish community that have windshields in their buggies and bright lights with batteries under the seat, she says, you will not come back to this house. <laughs> wow. Okay. So very strict. Interesting. Now, yes. speaking of dating, I want to get into what the the dating world was like what like if you had to court if your families both had to agree to it was it an arranged marriage kind of give us an overview of what dating was like in the amish well in the old order communities you have to stay within that ordinance there was two other churches maybe it became three just before i left another ordinance of a church that was similar to ours so we could go date out of those three churches if we wanted to because their ordinance kind of aligned with ours with the same rules but they really wanted us they my mom really made it clear please stay with an, uh, in our community here even if it's your first cousin they had no problem oh. with that we were allowed to marry first cousins and second cousins yes so you might have maybe a dozen girls you could choose from because the other 75 80 percent you were literally related to but mom said if you don't want the dozen or 15 girls that are available that you're not related to you know you can you can have a first cousin but that was more acceptable than straying off and marrying into a new order modernized on wow and so that the uh the dating was always at age 17. That was when you joined the singings, which would be called the youth group. We did not have running around room spring a season. So we just had a youth group when you're 17. And then you could date and, and take a girl home. Now you never ever, it's very prideful in my Amish community to go ask a girl on a date if she wants to go out on a date with you. You have to tell a friend or your brother to go ask for you. You never ask yourself. So when he goes and asks, he will report back to you a yes or a no. If it's yes, then you take her home and you have to always go to her house. Now, when you get to her house, the normal custom is that you have to let her parents know and they have an opportunity to supervise the date. You sit across the table from one another for the first couple of dates. And then if they're okay with it, if the parents are okay with it, then you can, they're on, you can sit in a rocking chair and she can sit on your lap and you can rock back and forth and talk and chat. But they always have to know you're there when you're there so that they have an opportunity to supervise you if they choose to do so. That is how the dates worked. Okay. You left when you were 18. So did you experience any of this? No, I did not. My twin brother Levi did, but I really, really made up my mind. I said, I will not date a girl because I had already made up my mind that I am out the door. I am going to escape to freedom. And if I start dating, I'm afraid that's going to prevent that. So I really was after what I, I know that sounds selfish, but no. I wanted what I wanted to make me happy, but I did not want a girl to hold me up. Yeah. No, that makes sense. Now, 17 is fairly old to even just start having a boyfriend or girlfriend. Did you find that you or other people when you were younger were kind of flirting with other girls or was that absolutely a no? It, it is no. It's forbidden, but it does happen. There was some flirting. There was things going on. We had a few instances where a girl was sexually molested. Uh, and, and that was always big chaos. You know, the elders would get together and they would talk about these issues, how we can prevent this, how we can stop it. Because 
I think it's very dangerous not to have sex education, which was forbidden in the in our uh, schools. There was just no education on that. And and when it comes to zero education on the dangers of it, you know, they don't teach anyone what is they don't teach what diseases are sexual diseases and they don't teach you where babies come from i did not even i figured out where a baby comes from on my own when i was 16 years old so if you don't know these things sometimes when you're a teenager your hormones start changing and you don't know how to react so all at once you find yourself doing something disgusting not realizing how really messed up and evil that is right yeah and i'm glad that you brought that up because that's definitely a topic i wanted to touch on today um what were some of the things aside from what you just mentioned that you noticed were kind of going in distorted ways because of this repressed sexuality well after leaving there was a, a group of former amish that i run into that started amish rescue mission and they actually focus on reaching back to help the victims uh, in the amish and mennonite communities across the u.s because that is so high rate in some of these communities very high rate. i couldn't put a percentage on it but there was so many of them leaving and then sharing their testimonies with me how they were sometimes it was incest through the brothers or their dad or an uncle or a grandpa and it was something that they did not have a grip on on a lot of the very conservative groups when i talk about this i'm talking about the very secretive cut off to society groups that don't have any control over this and they refuse to educate even what the word sex even means right i remember one time i heard an english man which did our milk he was the milkman and i heard him say something to dad using the word sex and i remember i mentioned that in the breakfast table the next morning i said hey that man that was talking to you you know he said the word sex what does that mean and i mean mom and dad ripped me away from the table and spanked me to let me know that you will get disciplined if you ever say the sex word ever again that is a bad word and that english person used it and you should have never heard that they did that because they are trained to keep that word hidden and not talk about what that means because if they they view it as kids and teenagers will try that try to have sex if they know what it means so they believe their original system they inherited they don't know any better they've always done it this way because their mom and dad told my mom and dad and taught them that way that if you just hide it from your children never teach it then there's less of a chance of this happening even though there were a few a few situations in the Amish community where I grew up in where that did happen among a brother or a sister, mm -hmm. where they actually had sexual intercourse, intercourse and some, some bad things happened like that. But it comes all down to no, not even being allowed to have sexual education, no discussion of it, even when you get up to be a teenage, teenager. So at age 12 and 13, my hormones started changing. You can about imagine the, the questions I had for mom, but I got zero zero answers for my questions mom said you'll understand that on your wedding day i said on my wedding day she said yep the bishop and the elders will always explain how babies are brought into the world when you get married mm -hmm. did you ever feel comfortable going to your dad because i know he was kind of on and off with the rules as I got older, just the last probably year and a half to two years before I left, I could be more open and ask dad and he was more open to talking about that, especially if he was already in the shunning mm -hmm. for something that he did wrong. So that was the time to ask that because he was just didn't care if it went against the church rules or not. So lots of times when I heard something about, hey, you know, my brother, he said something in church the other day with a youth group. I overheard him. He said something about, hey, People produce just like animals. Just look at the animals, how they reproduce. That's the same way with us humans. And I thought it sounded so sick because I was taught animals and humans can't be compared. So I actually did ask dad about that. I told you earlier that at age 16, I figured it out. Well, that's how I figured it out because I went to dad and I said, dad, is that sounds disgusting and sick. I said, is that true? And he says, well, son, that actually is true. I'm not going to lie to you. I know we're, I'm not supposed to say this. Don't tell mom. I verified it with you. But he says, yes, that is how you were brought into this world was through sex. And it was just like the animals reproduce. <laughs> and that's how I found out. Oh, my gosh. What's going through your mind? I mean, you said that at first it was disgusting. Did it was it like light bulbs? Were you just like, oh, it all makes sense now? Or how were you feeling when your dad told you this? It was kind of kind of both. You know, at first I was like, 
Oh, that is so sick. That is that just sounds so messed up. There's no way I could do such an act to a, a woman, a female. There's just that's just sick. That's like animals, you know. And the other side of me was like, oh, now see that made the light bulb kind of go off and like, wow, now I get it. You know, I was I was kind of glad and relieved to know though how that works. Yeah. So when you say zero sex education, I just need to put a whole bunch of boundaries around this so I'm really understanding. So you don't know what the word sex is. You don't know what it means. You don't know how reproduction works. So do they even give you any sort of knowledge around your own basic anatomy? Like boys learn about themselves and girls separately learn about themselves. Right. Yeah. They very much separated us, you know, for Saturday night bath night, which is the only time we got a bath. And we, all of us boys were in one, one room until we were all done taking a bath. We could all be naked among one another. That was fine until we all had our turn. Now, when we were done, we had to get upstairs, close our door. And that was monitored. Mom made sure we stayed upstairs while my sisters were taking their turn mm. and they were all together to get their bath all done and everything. So they very much separated us, did not want us to know this. And I want to just share real quick that I started interviewing interviewing people online just about 2019. And I had a uh, ex Amish girl that I, that I interviewed by the name of Susie. And she shared with me how, you know, her brother over and over kept on, uh, she didn't know what the stuff was that was coming out, you know, when he, right. uh, when he got off. Mm -hmm. So, so called, you know, so he was having sex with her and she didn't realize what that was. So she's trying to tell me that she had no idea that's where babies even come from. She still, this was happening to her when he was molesting her, oh, but she no. still did not realize that that is where babies come from. Yeah. But yet she was going through that. Oh my gosh. She didn't get pregnant. Did she? Uh, there, she didn't, but, you know, she didn't, oh, but she geez. shared a couple other women that did get pregnant at a very young age that they ended up having, you know, obviously take the baby away. They'd never allow, they don't let people know about what happened if it was a brother or an uncle or a family member. Usually they'll take that baby when it's born and you'll never hear about it again. A family will take it. They'll keep it secret. They don't let it leak out. Other, other Amish churches sometimes take it just to keep it hush hush. Oh my gosh. So they never get to see their child again. They just no. give it away to somebody else. Yes, that is correct. I interviewed one gal that said that she had she had a baby. She was impregnated by her grandpa. But she said it was either her grandpa or her uncle because they were both doing it over a five-year period. And when she had the baby, they immediately took that baby and it was gone. She never seen it ever again. She doesn't even know if an English family got it or an Amish family got it. Oh, my gosh. That is heartbreaking. So you can you can tell that even though that they don't have sex education, they don't want this to happen. They are so against this uh, having you know incest and rape and all of that sexual abuse. They're very against that. But due to the lack of education. It does happen. There's young men that are 13, 14, 15 years old that are their hormones are, are, are raging through them. They don't know how to act and they'll respond in a way where all at once they get addicted to it and they just take it out on their sister. Right. And so you have some of those happening around Amish communities. Yeah. Right. Well, if you don't even have a word for the act, you just know that it feels good. Of course, there's going to be some distortions mm -hmm. happening because you, there's no frame of reference. And that's the crazy thing about this whole purity culture thing is when you don't teach boundaries, you don't teach consent, you don't teach um, just even the basics of it, right? Like this is how this works and this will hurt if you don't do this. It just creates a lot of problems because we're humans and it's in our biology and it's going to happen anyway. So this whole abstinence only thing doesn't make any sense. And on the flip side, and I experienced this, not personally, but I know with Mormonism this happens. They do the same thing, the shame, the guilt. If you slip up before you're married, just forget about it. <laughs> you will feel guilty for a very long time. You will be punished for it. And then when you get married, have all the babies and you're just supposed to turn it on like everything's fine. And now it's beautiful and it's sacred and it's of God. And like the mind F <laughs> that you have to go through to make yourself okay with that, I can imagine is just so incredibly difficult. I never had to do that quick switch because I left Mormonism before I got married and I was able to kind of figure out my own sexuality, but it took years before all that guilt and shame went away and years before I understood even just like, I guess you could call it the basics of sex, but just like a healthy sex life, a healthy sexuality. So from what I understand, Amish people tend to get married young because they do want to have many children. So would you be able to speak to that a little bit? 
Yeah, yeah, they they are known to have many children. That is, they believe that is a blessing from God. They have big farms. They need help on the farms. They need help in the house. So their normal tradition is obviously to have as many children as they possibly can. Uh, my grandfather came out of a family of 20. One didn't live, so there was 19 living children. And the top, you know, two or three was married by the time the youngest one was born. So that is a normal custom for the Amish to have lots of children. So much so that when there's difficulty having children for the female, they will actually allow our church anyway, allowed us to go adopt from the outside and take children in, uh, even though they were not born or raised Amish, they even allowed us to go adopt like that. And also what I just mentioned earlier, obviously with the babies that were uh, born through incest or rape or stuff like that, those families, those couples that couldn't have children also would sometimes take those, but you just didn't really hear why they all at once had a kid. We always sometimes ask like, Hey, why did they just receive a newborn? I didn't know she was pregnant. Well, that's why, because they'll receive it from some of those messes, those situations. But they're all known to have those large families. That is a goal from, from marriage. As soon as they get married, they start having children. That is just a normal old order, new order, Schwarzenegger. All levels of Amish are known to have large families. Okay. Yeah. So when it comes to education, once you're married, do you actually know, has anyone um, talked to you about the talk that they get when they get married as to the extent of knowledge they are provided with upon getting married about sex? Well, after I left the Amish and was visiting my twin brother, which never, never shunned me. And he gave me some details on that because I left, obviously, before getting married. So he was telling me how stunned he was with in depth that they went into with his wife. Mm. They obviously knew he already knew. He made it known that he knows. But they sat down and they they told him and his wife, hey, this is how it works. And they went detail by detail how to have inter intercourse, how you insert it and literally went into detail talking about it in their German language. And then they proceeded to tell them, hey, this is normal Amish tradition that from for three days from today, you're getting married. And for three days, you shall not have any sexual intercourse. You have to stay pure for three days and pray for three days. Huh. That's something I didn't know until my brother told me because he went through it. And those things are all taught on the morning of your wedding when the bishop and the deacon and the elders are upstairs talking. They, they separate themselves to another room upstairs in their house to talk about all of this so that nobody overhears it. So that's the kind of education they go into. And then they also tell them, you know, that you're, you should have as many kids as you possibly can. That's a blessing from God. And mm -hmm. all of them in my family, my mom's sisters, every single year, it seems like they had one, you know, me and my twin brother are only a year apart from my older brother. And then a year and a half later, there's my brother, Perry, a year later, there's my brother, M Malin. And so every year my mom was having a child. Wow. <laughs> yeah. That's a lot for these women. And when it comes to I have so many questions, Eli, uh, <laughs> I'm trying to think of which one I want to ask first. I think I'm curious about the pleasure side of things, because even in mainstream society, the pleasure side isn't really spoken of in a healthy way. It's either people are watching porn to figure out how to have good sex or they just stay away from porn entirely, which I can understand and just don't really understand best practices. So I can imagine in a situation like this where they view sex as for procreation only, do they ever talk about the pleasure and the connection that a man and a wife can have? Or is it just solely based on making babies? Asking a question like that, I could go on for an hour on because my blood kind of boils when I think of some of the things tied with that. Uh, my brother, when he got married, he obviously tells me that the elders told him that sex is not for pleasure. They did teach that. Uh, they said that you're not, you shouldn't do that to just for pleasure. God wouldn't be pleased if you're just having sex every day for pleasure, but you should only focus on having sex when you were serious about having a child. So for example, there's 10 siblings. So that means they would rather have my dad just try it 10 different times. You know, if you want 10 children, you do it 10 times. Now there's a problem with that. With the sexual abuse that's been coming out of many Amish communities, the women were bl victim blaming, you know, victim blaming so much to where the one man out of Pennsylvania actually told the bishops, it's not his fault for what he did to his daughter. And then they had a meeting with his wife. They flipped the tables and shunned, not him, but shunned the wife because he actually said, well, she wasn't taking care of my sexual needs. Now, in my community, they wanted you to not have sexual pleasure. But in this situation in Pennsylvania, it was also old order. They blamed her for what he did to his daughter. And now she's getting shunned for six weeks while he didn't get any shunning because he wasn't meeting his sexual needs. 
that that stuff like that makes my blood boil oh my gosh that is awful that's so aggravating yeah it, it was just so aggravating that they would blame her for not meeting his sexual needs so i can tell you every community is different even though some strict communities like where i come from they really wanted you to focus on uh only having serious sex when you're serious about having a child or planning on having a child right. then there's others communities where they really teach the women must submit to the man physically mentally spiritually sexually financially everything across the board women just have to fully fully submit and when she don't then she can get punished for his disgusting abusive actions wow that is absolutely awful and disgusting and wrong to victim blame like that and it makes sense that when you have a society that is so restrictive when it comes to something that's so natural, it's going to come out in different ways. It's not going to be a healthy sexuality. And that's why you get these abusive stories. And it's just really heartbreaking to hear that because I also understand that they're doing this with the best of intentions. They're doing it because they genuinely believe yes. that that's what God wants and they genuinely want to have a relationship with God. So I, I'm not saying that what they're doing is wrong inherently. I think what they're doing causes a lot of issues. But yes. I just had to say that I know that they have the best of intentions when putting these rules in place. Yes, absolutely. I'm so glad you said that because everything they do across the board, not just the sex education part, but the rules, the religious aspects of it, everything they keep, all those values and beliefs they keep, they are doing it to the best way they know how. They believe this is the system they inherited that's going to please God, and they will literally die for that system, die for those beliefs because they believe that this, what they're doing and what they're practicing is God's church, and they're going to get rewards in heaven. So I always, when we talk about these really tough tough topics of evil that is going on in the Amish communities. I want people to look at the mindset. Yeah. Look at how, if you were there, you you might look, look at yourself as, how would I tolerate that? How could I put up with that? Well, if you were raised in it as a little child and you know no better, you are going to grow up defending that same tradition, those same beliefs and rules, and that same church, because that is all you're going to know and you just simply don't know better. So I really appreciate that you brought that up because they really are innocent in their minds. You're born and raised as a little child. This is all you know. This is what mom and dad taught us. Their mom and dad and their mom and dad taught them this. And you keep those same traditions, those same values. If there's no sex education, guess what? I believe that's the proper way to do it. If there's no uh, uh, anything, any awareness made as far as the incest, the rapes, and all of those kind of things, then you're going to grow up believing that you should never talk about that three-letter word or that the, the diseases, the rapes, all of that stuff is just, you're supposed to learn that when you get married on your marriage day, when the elders tell you that. So when you only know that, you're innocent at your mind and you're thinking, well, that's the way God would want us because we're Amish and this is what we inherited. So I always like ex talking about that to get people to kind of put yourself into their mindset to understand them, bring them, bring yourself down to their level and how they think. That way you can better understand. Like I used to get really frustrated and angry. Yeah, I hate the evil and, and it, I feel like a righteous anger, so to speak, about the evil that goes on. But I literally have to bring me down to their level and how they think. Mm -hmm. They think they're innocent. They think it's the right way to do it and that they will keep that and, until their death. Yeah, I think it's really important to talk about because it's far more nuanced than just right and wrong. And like you said, there's just so many factors that go into it and their intentions are there because they have a very strong belief and they think that they're doing it the right way. And also, they've never learned any differently either. If it's just what's passed down and what's passed down and what's passed down, there are there is no room for evolution or growth or learning child psychology or learning um, better sex education and new developments. And especially when you're so caught up, cut off from the world intentionally, there really is no room to make changes unless, of course, you go into a new order, like you mentioned, the new order Amish who are able to kind of evolve and grow. But that doesn't always happen. And so what we like to do here is just spread awareness about everything so that people can also be more compassionate towards those who are in these high demand groups and understand that it's not so easily right and wrong and black and white. There's so many more factors that contribute to this. So what I'd also like to know about, and we've got some questions around this too, is I'm curious about 
the education when it comes to pregnant women. So I'm not sure if you've had any experience speaking with um, women who have been pregnant in the Amish community, but I'm wondering what the stigma is like. Do they hide their pregnant bellies? Is it a beautiful thing because they're bringing life into the world? What's kind of the the picture around that? Well, in our home, it was very secretive. We were not allowed to know why mom's belly was way out. And dad always called it a sickness. It's that time of the year again where mom is having that sickness. So we, we grew up in our Amish home believing that mom had some kind of sickness or disease because that's what dad taught us. And then at church and at school, talking to other kids, they also said mom had a sickness. So we knew that this is a common Amish sickness to have their belly come bloating out like that. So we just didn't, but we were always suspicious. I remember one time I was talking to my buddy in church and in school, and I trusted him more than some of the others. His name was Menno. And I told Menno, I said, Hey, you know, last night I heard a baby crying in the middle of the night. And then the next morning I got up to milk cows and dad said, Hey boys, come on in here. You have a new sister. And I said, you know, mom's belly was not out no more. So that disease ended really quick. Oh, oh my <laughs> so, gosh. So, so I remember talking about that because at a certain age, you start wondering about those things. You yeah. know, why is, is, is she sick in the evening when we're eating supper and her belly's way out? And then the next morning you're he hearing a baby crying and she no longer has the sickness, but they do have a tradition of, of hiring mates when a baby's born and the mother always stays in bed for at least a month up to about six four to six weeks they'll stay in bed and and she just takes it easy and rests and you know uh, takes care of the baby breastfeeding is always common to breastfeed naturally and all of that so they kind of do that and that kind of helps helps kind of explain away the sickness or disease that the mom has because she's in bed and there's a maid coming over. Uh, they always hire, sometimes it's a cousin or a family member, or it could be a complete stranger. And it's always a woman that is called a maid. In, in German, we always call it a mod. And the mod always came when mom had that sickness and helped take care of mom. So we knew every time mom did have that disease or sickness with her belly coming out, it always resulted in a baby. And we, we <sighs> definitely figured that one out. <laughs> Wow. I'm just so surprised that a community that prides themselves on bringing the Lord's children to the earth would hide such a beautiful process with these mothers and call it sickness. It's not not even something else, but like making it seem like she's defective or hurting. And so, I mean, yeah, I'm sure she's hurting, but you know what I mean? It's just so interesting that they would view it that way. Yes. Yeah. That was all top secret stuff. And then of course, uh, about 2019, there was enough former Amish that had left and they started making awareness and interviewing, you know, a lot of different victims that came out. There was a reason why so many women that were leaving is because of obviously sexual abuse, incest and rape. So sometimes we would run across a few of them that would say, hey, you know, I, I got pregnant when I was still in the Amish and I had no idea what it was. The one girl, it shocked me. She said, I was literally pregnant because of rape and I didn't even know what it was. I felt movement. I didn't know what it was all the way up until delivery, until the uh, oh my gosh. Uh, midwife. They call it a midwife in the Amish that comes over to help deliver it. And until that baby came out, that's when she realized I just had a child. And that's when she realized how a baby's even born. So you have some very extreme cases like this in the very secretive Amish communities. That is absolutely terrifying. That is terrifying for you to discover, first of all, how your own anatomy works and how babies are made. And now you're a mom all in the same day. Like, I can't even I can't even imagine. We have some questions here around childbirth because. Um, I assume that you have the babies at home. So someone asked here, how often do women and babies die during childbirth? So it's different in, in all Amish communities because there's a lot of them that are now open to go to the hospital more than what we did. We were very against going to the hospital for anything. Mm -hmm. Did it happen? Yes. Occasionally it did happen. Now, all me and my 10 siblings were born at home, including two sets of twins. My dad, along with a Amish midwife that was educated, you know, obviously not licensed, but still educated on knowing what she was doing. She always came over to help my dad. My dad told me this himself when I was actually about 16 years old and the whole baby subject came came up. And that's when I learned that the midwife always came over to help my dad, but we were all born at home. Now I did a video. I want to say early 2020, when I started TikTok, I did a video out at the Amish cemetery to show, you know, your question you just asked mm -hmm. over half of the tombstones 
said stillborn baby and then the parents' names on it. Mm -hmm. That in itself proves that they tried to deliver the child themselves and were unsuccessful and then they just go bury it. Oh no, that's heartbreaking. Now I also want to make a distinction here because I am for home birth when you have the right team and you're not a high risk pregnancy. I think having a baby naturally is a really beautiful physiological thing that our bodies are meant to do. So I don't want it to be misconstrued that I'm against that. I think what I wanted to illustrate here though is when you have zero education around birth in your own body and what's going on, that's when the issues can arise, especially if there is a complication and you're not allowed to go to the hospital. That's just really heartbreaking. Yes. Yeah. I, I think, uh, well, I had a cousin that left the Amish and he, uh, his wife didn't want to leave, you know, with him and the children. So he ended up leaving, but he shared with me in his first child, you know, he was newly wed and he had, they had their first child and there was a lot of complications. The midwife didn't know what to do. Mm -hmm. The baby wasn't coming out right. And there was literally a hand and, and part of a foot stick. It was all concocted. Oh, it was all no. weird. And he knew the baby was going to die if it was either just try to do what we can and then bury the baby because he wasn't going to live or let's go call an English, use an English people's phone, you know, and call for a driver and rush this baby to the hospital. And that is exactly the choice he made. Mm. They ended up going to the hospital and that baby survived because they made that decision. Oh, that's so good to hear. That's so good to hear. But you said yeah. that that's really uncommon in old order Amish. Yes. In the strict conservative groups. And, and they were allowed by the church. There's not really a rule that says, hey, you cannot go to the hospital. You can as long as you have the money to do so. Mm -hmm. My family was very poor. And I think that's why we always just made a decision. You either live or you die kind of mentality. But there are majority, I want to say probably majority, 90 some percent of Amish in the world absolutely go to the hospital for major problems you know when it comes to birth or broken bones or okay. surgeries or cancer a lot of them do but you know we just the old order are more you know, you know just holding back on that like hey why spend money on these computers the worldly people are using to try to do surgeries and all of this stuff they just kind of believe in having faith let's just put it in god's hands you either live or you die got it that's what i was going to ask next is if you are able to go to the hospital are there still certain restrictions that are placed on you for example in jehovah's witnesses, they're not allowed to get blood transfusions. Is there anything similar to that in the Amish? Yes, they did have some restrictions on, let's say, life support. They were very against that machine keeping the body alive. Let's say your brain did. Like, you know, my father, he was still alive for several days after mm -hmm. he attended his and they had him on the computer on the life support, obviously. And they knew that they were just kind of waiting on the family to show up or whatever. And I remember the bishop told my mom and her sisters, hey, let's let's go into the room here at the hospital. And they wanted to have an immediate meeting right now. After that meeting, they said, we have to take Henry Yoder off of life support. And that's when I was like, mom, why is it all at once they're taking life support off? Is it because you want to do it? And she goes, well, no, that's what the bishop and the, and the churches you know, mm -hmm. wanted to do. And they did not believe that you should depend on some worldly machine to keep him alive. Now, blood transfusions did happen. I know several Amish that had some serious problems in our community that went up, you know, for appendix emergency, had to get the uh, appendix removed. And there's certain uh, circumstances where I remember hearing uh, blood transfusion being needed. Now, we also had a tradition to go and donate blood to the English worldly system that called the American Red Cross. Right. Every eight, every eight weeks on a Monday, we were allowed, we were encouraged to go donate our blood. And that's how I found out through the cart that the American Red Cross gave me that I had a positive blood. And I was very prideful about that. I was 17 years old and they allowed us to go donate blood because they knew that that was a loving thing to do, that it would help other people save their lives if they need blood. So we were actually not against blood transfusion like the Jehovah's Witness would be. Okay. Interesting. Well, I'm really glad that they're not completely cut off from medical intervention because while I don't necessarily agree with all of the big pharma stuff, there is certainly a place for modern medicine and the technology that it provides and how it can save lives. So that's good to hear. Um, all right. Yes. So I have another question here. How many people have you helped leave the Amish and what is the biggest hurdle you face in the process of helping people leave? Thanks for sharing your story and teaching us, quote, worldly folk, these things. Since I have left, I counted one day to try to get a good number, and I thought I was right around 100. 
I got to over 200 people that I have helped leave now since I've left 25 years ago. Wow. Just in the last two and a half years, I have helped more than half of that number because of my online uh, videos. Uh, a lot of the Amish that are not allowed to have phones, they do have phones. So what they'll do is they'll even message like privately. And I also have an email I attached. If they're able to email, they'll email. Sometimes I've even heard from drivers to speak on their behalf that watch the video on his phone and they will reach out and say, Hey, this Amish man or young, you know, eight sometimes are also underage. And I, I feel bad because I tell them legally, I can't really help them because it's illegal to do so. They're not an adult, mm -hmm. but then it's amazing to see how they'll watch a video and they'll reach out through a driver to see if I could pick them up. I'll get their location. We do a little bit of communicating and all at once we got them out of there and we got them with a former Amish construction crew. So it's been such an honor to be able to help these people. I just, my biggest goal is to bring as many as possible if they want to. I believe the Amish should be left alone to live their freedom of religion rights uh, to be Amish. But I also believe in helping those that don't want to be there, that want to have a chance at freedom to live a different life if they choose to do so. Yeah. And I want to be one of those avenues to give them that chance to come down that avenue and experience this life. Some of them have went back that I've helped. That's fine. I don't force them to stay out here. Uh, the biggest thing is to give them an opportunity, the ones I help to leave. I always let them know they have a, a right to choose how what they want to do. You want to do construction. Do you want to go get your GED like I did? You want to be you want to become a cop? See, I have a younger brother that left and he became a cop K9. Now he's uh, got his training for the SWAT team. And now he's moved on from a police officer to a sheriff deputy. And like he, there's just, n there's no limits. And I just, I'm so blessed to see him succeed. So I always let the Amish that are wanting to leave to let him know, Hey, you can have goals out here. You don't have to doubt who you are. You, you don't have to doubt that you can't do, be a doctor or go to the moon and, and be whoever you want to be. If you got some dreams, go fulfill those dreams. And so yeah. I, it, that's what's so fun now for me. It's just letting these people know that reach out. I will never try to dissect the Amish and forcibly say, oh, you got to leave. That's just a cult. Well, some have cult behavior, but I don't want them to feel like I just hate that kind of lifestyle. If they want to be Amish, they should be allowed to be Amish, but I just love helping those that reach out and they want to leave. You know, it's just been amazing. More than 200 of them now that I've left. Now, sadly, I will say this. I wish there, the women in the conservative groups would have more avenues, more freedom yeah. to reach out to people like me and others because they're in the house, they're cooking, cleaning, making homemade clothes, cooking, canning. They're just so busy and they don't really communicate to a whole lot of outsiders. So out of those 200 plus people I helped leave, there's only been several women. Wow. That's really surprising because especially, well, it's not surprising because of the reasons you just said, but it is surprising in the way that the women are often pushed down, they're second class citizens, and it would seem like they would be the ones who would most want their freedom. Right, right. And, and there are many former Amish women I have run into since I've left. But personally, with the people I know in the conservative groups, those are very low rates of women leaving. The newer order Amish that allow the whole rumor spring thing mm -hmm. running around for a season, that's where the women are leaving from because they get out there and they get to talk to people and communicate. And they have an escape route much easier than the conservative sheltered communities would. Yeah. And you know what? To wrap this up, I would actually love it if you would explain rum spring up because there's been a lot of question around that. And I have to admit, I don't know much other than I think you're just allowed to experience the world. But then do you have to come back? Like, what are the rules around that? Yeah, the reason my church did not allow us to to be associated with Room Spring is because it is about a two year season. Usually, the the custom is to start at sixteen, and by the time you're eighteen, you're supposed to get baptized into the church and make that oath and swear to follow the Amish rule and its ordinance until death. Okay. So they give you this this two year window of joining this room springer group that can go out and party, and basically they're just opening the door for you to. Hey, go experience and be wild and party and do whatever you want. They're, they know they're going to do drugs. They're going to have sex. They're going to get drunk. They're going to wow. do all this stuff. And, and I'll be honest with you. <laughs> some of the ones I picked up to leave the Amish or had a driver pick up, they literally picked them up at one of these parties where there was like 2000 scattered out through a field, sometimes wooded areas. I got a video that is amazing. A young man sent it to me through TikTok and they were out there. The women had their caps on and they're out there jumping up and down with boom boxes and partying and they were having a good time getting drunk. Uh, unfortunately, I'm, I'm sure there's uh, <laughs> quite a bit of babies born through that, <laughs> but, but they just go out there and they get wild. They just get crazy. So sometimes uh, in those groups that allow that, 
during that season of running around like in northern Indiana, Shipshawana, Nabonee area, during that season, they can come in on a Sunday at church. They have to leave their vehicle out at the end of the driveway, not come the rest of the way in and mix it in with the buggies. But they still want those youngsters in Rome Springer to come to church on Sunday. And they're allowed to park their cars out by the road or the end of the driveway. And I went through one of the, one of the church Sundays. I saw it from my own with my own eyeballs that they were parked there. And I was like, wow, this is so different than my community because that's what was happening. They allow them to come back. They want them to hear the word being preached, but they know that they're, they're going to cut them loose. And then when you turn 18 and you have experienced all that fun of the world, they want you to then make the decision. Do I now want to join the church and get baptized? Or do you want to stay of the world? The families cry and they, they grieve if the if the young man or woman decides to stay of the world. But sometimes they do stay out. And that's some of the ones that we try to also get on construction teams mm-hmm. to, to work and, and make a living and get jobs and stuff like that. If they choose to stay out. So the reason we're getting more and more now to stay out of the Amish is because of that season of running around. And they're coming and staying out after that is complete. And that's literally why my com- community doesn't allow it because it just opens the door for them to leave. Yeah. I feel like there's so many positives and so many things that could also not be great. So the positives, clearly, you get to experience the world. You get to see what it's like on the outside. Um, you can do whatever you want, no consequences, and you get to make the decision if you want to go back or not. Love that. Love, love, love. What's a little bit scary for me is if you're coming from a group who, like we just mentioned, has no sexual education, doesn't know anything about the world, doesn't know what drugs or alcohol are, they don't know what a healthy level of consumption is. It could get really, really dangerous if they don't have anyone guiding them through the world during that time. Do you know if they have people who kind of help or are there outsiders like English people who help guide these people for two years? Like, How do they survive out there? (laughs) Yeah, there's a lot of outside influence with former Amish that try to get involved with them. I know quite a few of them that go in and try to help, you know, at least start with, hey, I'm here as a designated driver. I'm here to make sure you get home safe. We have a whole bunch of former Amish and non-Amish, regular English people that do this because our heart goes out to them. We've been through that. I left the Amish and became a severe alcoholic. I had a DUI. I got, I landed myself in jail a couple of times. So I, I know what they're, what they're going through at that young age. You're, it's almost like you're getting freedom too fast and it gets you in trouble. Right. And so we always try to get people that is a great influence in their lives to help them along the way and not just make so bad because a few of them, unfortunately, are in prison for a long time because they did make some very horrible decisions. Right. Yeah. I feel like it could get bad really fast or a little too wild, a little too fast, not to mention they're very young. I feel like it would be a little bit of an easier time if you were maybe 18 to 20 to have that (laughs) <laughs> that experience versus when you're so young. But I am happy, like I said, that they have that option to go and explore. So I'm going to end with one more question. And it's probably going to take us in a whole different direction. But let's just see what happens. So this is from Svetlana, her horses, 6526. Oh, frick yeah. Eli Yoder is here. (laughs) I want to ask him about how Amish people treat their horses. Do they work the horses like machines or do they love the animals and work with them as partners? How did he feel when he had to be separated from his favorite horse when he escaped? This is actually a very common question asked on my TikTok and my YouTube channel. So many people ask this, and I I think a lot of people take it the wrong way. Other people get it when I say this, and I want you to understand Think of the 1700s before Henry Ford made the first Model T car. Think of how the whole world lived back in 17th century where everybody used horse and carriage or horse and buggy. They worked in the fields with a plow and everything was about horses. And that's what the Amish still do today. They use horses for work and they use horses for travel. Now, a lot of people in today's society, they look at the Amish as you're working the horses too hard. You're abusing them. Now, is there is there abuse, animal abuse? Sure. There's some of them that we actually had to have meetings with a couple of Amish guys that were kind of lazy mentality. And you could see the ribs on the horses and they were malnourished. And the church did not like that. Do you have to take care of your horse because they they are your life? They're, they It's, it's your your way of life, work and for travel. They did not like when somebody became lazy, but overall, 
I don't look at as many of them abusing their horses. We just work them really hard uh, because the, the fields have to be harvested. The fields have to be worked up and plowed every single year, just like everybody did in the 17th and 18th century before cars were made or tractors. And so a lot of people view that as abuse. Now, I have shared stories that made people sad that, you know, we had a horse that was old. And sometimes you're out in, you know, I was only eight years old and I had all these horses, 14 of them. And I'm just working along and one of our orders, her name was April and she fell over dead mm. uh, in, in the heat. You know, every time I go around the field, we would stop and give her a break and let him catch her breath. And then you go around the field again, but she was old and she just croaked and fell over. And I shared that before. And I, I noticed after I shared that story, how we had to sell her to a English person that always came around the Amish and bought these horses for slaughterhouses for $250 off of us. And they made dog food. They processed dog food out of those horses oh, that were, geez. that died. And so after I shared that, I realized that a lot of people thought that was horrible. Now, me personally, I will tell you, I don't have a big problem with that because everybody in the 17th century lived that way. They, they had whips on the, on the buggies to, to get the horse going and train the horse. That's not abuse. That's training a horse. That's making them obey you. So it, it's just something that if you're born and raised in, you don't see it as much. But I, I, I do understand that some people just believe that, oh, that is just so horrible how we used horses to, to you know, get them down the road and make them run fast and get home. And I don't know. Everybody's got to evaluate, evaluate that for their, for themselves, I guess. I know we're in a different society now and it's easy to, uh, you know, love and care. And I love my horses. I miss, actually, I miss my team of horses I had before I left. And I really wish I could have had room to take them with me, but I knew I couldn't because I really loved horses. I got close to so many horses where some of my siblings and even my dad couldn't figure out, they, they called me the horse whisperer. Mm. I could go up and pet a horse and just slowly talk in German and rub their side of their head. And it's like they just come down and, it, and it's like they understand me. And they would follow me wherever I go, but I had a very good connection with animals. I was like, I would whisper to animals and talk to them. So I loved horses. I would feed them, make sure they have hay and grain and water every single day. I always make sure that they were taken care of. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I can imagine that there's certainly different opinions when it comes to animals. And I can see. I can see the perspectives on all sides as far as that goes, um, but we don't need to get into that. I really appreciate you coming back and sharing more with me and having those hard conversations because I know they're difficult and it's very uncomfortable to talk about the dark corners of these spaces that do have some good in them. And I know that you feel that same way too. There are certainly really beautiful parts of the Amish lifestyle that I think you still find beautiful and even us outsiders can find them beautiful. But it's also important to call out the things that aren't being talked about, the things that are swept under the rug and spread more awareness about these groups. So I appreciate you. Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much for uh, having me on and, and making awareness about the good, the bad and the ugly. I admire their lifestyle. And I often say this, I would still be there if it was just the lifestyle itself. I love the plain living. I love farming with horses. The food is amazing. I love it living off the grid, off grid living. Yeah. If you could just get rid of the power and control and the rules and the religious aspects of it, yeah. I would be fine. Yeah, that's a really great point. And with that, do you have another Linda Listen moment that you can share, a sassy statement or any inspiration? Well, for anybody that is searching for truth, anybody that is searching to maybe find out who God is, should I be religious to get to heaven? Should I just be a good person to get to heaven? Whatever you're searching for, make sure you go to the right source. Don't just listen to anybody or any religious group or denomination or people because people, there's voices everywhere. Many of them are out to deceive others. Follow me, follow me, follow me. And there's so many prideful groups out there that's claimed to be the ones. So be very careful who you listen to. The Bible has all your answers. Religion does not. Religion usually becomes a Sunday morning little business and they're motivated for the wrong reasons, maybe money or whatever, power control, pride. So be very careful who you go to for your answers. Yeah. And I would just piggyback on that and say, go to yourself and your own intuition and find your own personal relationship with God if that's something that makes you at peace and makes you happy. Yes, I love that. Beautifully said. Beautifully said. So, Eli, thanks so much again for joining us. I'm going to put all of your links to your YouTube channel and your TikTok in the description below, below and on the screen. And before we go, do you have any final thoughts? No, not really. I think that's that'll about do it. Thank Amazing. you very much for uh, what you guys are doing to have all these people on and across the, the nation and different groups and 
just started listening to watching your channel and I didn't realize how many groups are out there. And I really am blessed to see how you guys are giving a voice to those that were silenced. And it's, it's important to make awareness in on all of all across the board and all of these groups. So thank you very much for what you guys are doing. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you so much for your support. And for everyone else who is watching, thank you for your support too. If you could like and comment, that helps the algorithm. It shows support for our guest here today. And if you want to become a patron, you can do that at patreon.com slash cults to consciousness. My newest patrons, Patty and Emily, thank you so much for your contribution. And if you like this video, I will put his other video down here below and another one that you would like to watch. And until next time, follow your highest excitement, be conscious and be well.